Welcome back to Let's Play Sunless Sky Sovereign Edition. Last episode, we made our way into Eleutheria, and um, we found some few friends at uh, Pan. We obtained the Cloak of the Lion for the Unseen Queen in our quest for the Martyr King Cup, and we located a scientist at the Behringer Wreck. Here we are at Langley Hall. A mansion found in Eleutheria. Um, it's a well-known place for partying. An endless party. And it's bigger on the inside. So let's see what it has in store for us. A sprawling house of numberless rooms. Founded by Lord Langley. It is a refuge for those willing to brave the dark of Eleutheria. Outside it stands the last lamppost. Last lamppost, the furthest flung beacon of London life. His lordship's grand clear out, the maids of Langley Hall, hustle you into a quiet corner of the house where they are auctioning off some of Lord Langley's unwanted possessions at bargain prices. Eh, uh, might be good. His lordship won't mind, they assure you, because his lordship will never find out. It was a uh, acquire a roll of thirsty bombazine. It was a curtain in the hollowed hallway once. The moths have dined upon it. A furtive deal is struck. The maids hurry you out of the room, promising to sneak the goods onto your engine as soon as possible. They prove as good as their word. <clears throat> the jetty off the edge of nowhere. The cottage, a cottage the size of a cathedral. Mellow candlelight shines through its frosted windows like split spilt treacle treacle is like um black ichor or just like like tar basically here the vanished lord langley founded a home away from home a london for the exile the lost and the forlorn lovelorn distance is suspended inside no one has ever claimed to have charted the entirety of the limitless hall enter langley hall all are welcome here, provided they that they are welcoming of all here. Welcome, traveler. A man in a faded postal uniform greets you at the end of a battered jetty. He carries a shutter lamp in one hand. It's light, the amber, deep amber hue of the last lamppost. Hello, hello. A new guest. This way, please. Let's get you somewhere warm. He produces a set of keys and strides towards the oak-paneled front door of the house. He knocks thrice, then unlocks the door. This way. The sound of laughter spills out. Inside, an endless house party is in full swing. Guests who enter Langley Hall rarely leave. Thus, this hall is the oldest part of Langley's project. project. From here, staircases wend their way to other rooms, halls, landings and wings of the cottage. Guests sit on stairs, sing from the banisters or promenade along the hall in search of friends. The closest door to the entrance is wide open, revealing a cloakroom the size of a village green. Fires crackle in seven hearths. Someone has set up a bar. We'll take a poor report. Langley Hall is widely considered to be a folly and a fool's paradise. Have those who say such visited Good tidings. Langley Hall is a labyrinth of well-intentioned jolli uh, jollity. Parties snake from the door front door to the back kitchen by way of a thousand bedrooms, bathrooms, billiard rooms, and ballrooms. The wine flows like water and the hour is always hazily too late. Those that come here rarely leave and those that do, rarely do for long. They have made a home of Langley Hall, or at least Langley Hall has made a home, made for them a home. <clears throat> Sign the guest book. Just a little formality, the post officer says ap ap uh, apologetically. Don't worry, we don't have many here. Mm. Captain. Oh, it changes your your front moniker. Okay, we were already captain. Eh. Hang up your coat and hat, explore more options. You run the risk of wanting to come back. 
Inquire after Lord Langley. It's only polite to introduce oneself to the master of the house and the host of this endless party. The post officer looks deeply uncomfortable. Uh, uh, not sure I ought to say his lordship's business. This is his party, see? He found the house and wanted guests, invited those of us who, for one reason or another, weren't suited for what London had become. New London made him sick to his stomach, he said. The post officer runs a hand through his hair. I won't betray his hospitality, but I'll tell you what, what I know if you agree that if you do find him, you'll respect his wishes. That's what this place is about, respecting each other. Except, you'll respect the intentions of Langley Hall, or say you will at any rate. The postal officer bites his lower lip. It's the topic of choice here. Where's Langley? Have you seen Langley? He sighs. <sighs> Anyone who knows, who says they know the answer is lying. But if you want a place to start looking, when he was with us, he favored a particular chair in the lounge. An old friend of his is still in the yellow drawing room and he was on good terms with the cook. He considers you for a moment. What is he? What if he doesn't want to be found? What if, wherever he is, he doesn't want to come back? Well, we will leave Langley Hall. We'll have it, we'll save it for another time. Away, the post officer escorts you to the dark. Not good to go out in, out in the dark alone, Captain. He shadows you all the way to your engine. He waits on the platform as you make ready for departure. Even as the dark rolls in to swallow your engine, the amber light from his lantern lingers. Let's see if we can't grab some fuel. Okay, we are looking for a griever. And I think we'll find him. Some of them at either the Fulmination or the Dementine Reach. Let's explore this back area for, for a little bit. The Waste of Words? Yeah, we'll, we'll... Yeah, let's check it out. You enter homuncula littered with the wreckage of unwise engines. Alright, we found one. A griever. Wakey wakey. Extract the griever's soul for the diabolical driver. Several globs of griever remain. They continue to spew livid or ichor into the sky. You order your driver to get as close as possible. It isn't easy. In its dying throes, the griever vomits up old, semi-digested spaces that it devoured long ago. One moment, it is mere yards away, the next, a mile. The Devourers of Distance The petite devil who was a contriver, who the contriver assigned to assist you, opens an exterior hatch and unwraps the implement she brought with her. Usually, the instrument used to extract a soul is the size and shape of a tuning fork, but this one is the length of a bill hook and triply pronged. She thrusts it into the griever's maw, twists, and drags out a soul like the memory lightning leaves on your eyes, jagged, ghostly, and sharp. She wrestles it into a bell jar. Freaky. Alright, uh, well, let's check out the Xanthus moon real quick. Seems to be another... Fuck me. We might have a problem. There may be an undeparted that is following us. Doesn't matter though, we found the Xanthus moon. The electric Mongolian moon. Gentlemen.
The moon sill. The Xanthus moon. The nearest land to the Xanthus moon is the moon sill. The path between it and the Empyrean main dock is well traveled by groups of small, privately owned engines. Each convoy resembles a crowd of fireflies drawn to the light of the moon. They travel here to perform rites of resolution and renewal and to conduct the mandate of the moon. Dock at the moon sill. Several Empyrean engines have all have landed already. There's room for plenty more. A ritual. The Imperials light only enough lamps to pick their way to the site of the ceremony. Occasionally, there is a muffled curse as someone stumbles and falls. The Imperials gather in a large crater, huddled together, waiting. It is the time for the rite of resolution. The engineers have landed. They stand outside the circle of Imperials, their clothes in tattered, smeared with oil and dirt. But they are safe, and they are sound. All around you, lanterns are lit. A warm glow grows and brightens. The, cl uh, the crowd parts. The engineers climb up to its center. Join the right or wa uh, stand back and watch. One supply. Before the engineers can be welcomed back, their names must be restored. Afterwards, they will want a good hearty meal. While working on the moon, they have had to make do with only plain rice. Oh, so this is like the equivalent of the clockwork sun. You've got people working on the sun and people maintaining the upkeep of the Xanthus moon. Um, uh, I mean, let's just say I'm a white guy that wants to... <laughs> Dabble in a little culture. A tourist, if you will. We'll join the right. Welcome. Repast. Or repast. Or repast. Each engineer's name is held by a loved one who steps forward holding a wax scroll. Each scroll is soaked in a cup of wine until the, uh, uh, the ink runs from it and mingles with the liquid. Each engineer drinks the wine the crowd erupts in delight. The engineers turn eagerly to what you have brought. They've had moon rations for weeks. Your fungal crackers, wrinkled apples, and pungent slabs of cheese are like a feast. They're delighted to gift you a memento of their deployment for it. One of the moon's broken, burned-out lanterns. They say it's set to bring good luck. One artifact, okay, good trade. Join the Imperials, returning to their engines. The ceremony over, they depart, still holding their wax paper lamps. A community dispersing. Impatient captains frown at crew, putting off boarding to prolong conversations. Exasperated parents hunt for their straying children. It'll be a little while yet before the moon sill is back under the sole stewardship of its caretakers. Lovely. Okay, Japan. Our terror did not drop, which is not good. A seven casks. Gotcha. Deposit our items, our cargo. Seven casks of Neveratine gemstones. Six seven. Alright, and now, back up to the Behringer. Yes. Oh, fucking hell. I can't deal with that right now. Nope, 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 nope. <laughs> There is an absolutely terrible monster uh, that lies within those um, voids. Terrible. Just terrible. We'll board the Behringer. 
we will speak to the diabolical contriver. You're known to her, her guard, a burly, huffing goat demon, will let you pass. The bi diabolical contriver is lean and brusque. Her, oh, I already read this. Okay, deliver. First, large quantities of gemstones. The central mechanism is too complex and precise to be fashioned from any physical material. Instead, we must construct it from light. The gemstones will be our refractors. The Radiant Heart. One of the devils is a lapidarist. Lapidarist? Lapidarist? Oh. Wait, no. I don't know what that means. <laughs> Wait, let me just check real quick. Who? Lapidary or lapidary is the practice of shaping stones, minerals, or gemstones into decorative items such as engraved gems and faceted designs. And begins cutting them into exact shapes. He carefully positions a candle in their midst, its light reflecting in brilliant beams from one jewel to another. You watch as, gem by gem, the heart of the engine is constructed from arcs of very colored light. Once complete, it is a beating luminosity. It, cor it courses with color and dazzles the eyes. A devil encases the heart in a lead box and installs it in the center of the new engine. Deliver the soul of a griever. There's a limit to the speed that an engine can achieve and a limit to the speed that the human body can tolerate. Therefore, we have, to, we have been forced to cheat. Eating up the miles, the contriver gives a thin, pleased smile when you hand over the bell jar. The grievers once devoured places that were never meant to be. Our engine will duplicate their appetites. Rather than simply propelling your locomotive, it will consume a portion of the miles before you, removing the need to traverse them. The effect will be more distance covered in less time. She seems pleased by, by this egregious disrespect of fundamental cosmic laws. Deliver a searing enigma. Certain laws of science impede our work. We have a law furnace that will allow us to unmake those laws. But the thing is, a devil, uh, but the thing is a devil to light. Ignition. The law furnace is a squat, brutish machine of black iron, currently cold. You lean close and whisper a word in the language of the suns. Lazy flames lick at your throat, and something catches light in the fire pan. A flickering blue ember. The devils hurry forward to feed it with statute books and transcripts of court judgments and stern tablets from the Blue Kingdom. Gradually, the fire grows. You ask the contriver which law she needs to break to make her engine. Just one, she says. The law that determines what can be alive. Complete the experimental engine. You have provided everything the contriver asked. Now, only the final stages of construction remain. It will take several days. This will award you an exotic engine. The Devourer of Distance. With the vital components in place, the engine comes together like the final pieces of a puzzle. Its radiant heart quickens in anticipation as the casing closes around it. Its workings more delicate than a Swiss pocket watch click like the scuttling of a thousand brass beetles. The contriver has already lost interest. Take it. It was only ever a prototype. The act of creating it was the point, and has taught me what I needed to know. I am eager for the real work to begin. The devils grin and flex their fingers. You lay your hand on the engine and it quivers, emitting a noise like laughter. It likes you. We have created the Devourer of Distance. Good luck. The Devourer of Distance grants a reasonable increase to base speed, but a significant enhancement to full steam mode. Beware, once activated, it takes a long time to disengage. Should you ever lose the Devourer, it will return to the Behringer. And you, or another captain in this lineage, can retrieve it from there. Interesting. Okay, and we are out. We are not trying to help <laughs> any of these revolutionaries.
Long live the queen. There it is. We'll test it out. In a little bit. Requires crew at 12. The devour of distance. It is unquestionably alive. Though its basic running speed isn't as high as the Tisiphone's, when the devourer reaches full steam, nothing in the skies can outrun it. But be warned, once it has started, it doesn't want to stop. Leave plenty of room to slow down. Mm. So it's slower than our current speed right now. But, um... I guess it goes faster at full speed. Okay, please God, drop our terror. <laughs> For the love of God, please. Thank God. Clocks are not welcome, okay. The hour, uh, blah blah blah. Hour of arguments, when the factions of Pan gather in the forum to debate and quarrel. The piping of the Adamant Idol has become a military march. It is the hour of argument, where Pan's inhabitants gather at the forum to resolve matters that can't be settled through a payment, a duel, or a murder. The artists of the Neo-Nocturnal School maintain the forum. Their sculptures of long-limbed ecstatics litter the stage. We will take listen and observe. The current Cypress King presides over the debates, making rulings if an agreement can't be reached. Watching the audience, reps of Pan, Pan's many factions crowd the stone seats. The revolutionaries of Winners reside, each wearing a flash of red. The plastic gardeners of the Heartcatchers, a crowd of flamboyant neo-nocturnals, and a dozen other minor, minor cults and coteries, colorful in Eleutheria's velvet darkness. Even a rep of the Brazen Brigade is here, a look of profound distaste on his elegant face. The Brigade dislike anything that smacks of republicanism, in the same way that someone who once experienced bad prawns has no desire to do it again. Oh, Kerry, we've got our engine. Let's do it. Goodbye, Tisiphone. Time to purchase some fuel. <laughs> okay. One experiment, four artifacts, five specimens. Two moments, three treasures, 22 visions, and 32 sky stories. One tail, two charts, 16 secrets. We're doing okay, we're not doing bad. Alright. Last order of business. Take a beeline to the Empyrean. Yes. And then we'll hit Polmir's <laughs> for the blindness throne. It's time to see what the Devourer of Darkness, dar I keep saying darkness, Devourer of Distance is made of. Oh, that's fast. That's real fast. All right, into the midnight belt. Not bad.
the lane of lions and unicorns, a little piece of Albion on the edge of the Empyrean. Here, Her Majesty's Embassy works tirelessly to maintain cordial relations with the Imperials. London's Enclave, Her Majesty's Embassy dominates this little street, but the eagle stands above the lion and the unicorn on the street sign. London and the Connet work together to enter the High Wilderness, but their alliance since has been tenuous. It is preserved only by desperate di <laughs> diplomatic endeavor and a number of carefully preserved fictions regarding what the other is up to. Introduce myself at the Embassy. I can get a visa here, required to enter the Empyrean proper. They might be glad to receive news from London. Few captains dare venture into Eleutheria. A brisk welcome. The Embassy is a fine example of Georgian architecture. Inside, the elegance gives way to a pandemonium of desks where uh, bureaucrats minutely scrutinize their correspondence. Any mistakes can trigger a summons to the Khan and the possible expulsion of the Embassy. Each is hunched with age, with hair as white as lustrum snow. The Ambassador's secretary is assigned to handle incoming captains. He reaches over a mountain, of ra a mountain range of papers with a visa. Please don't make additional work for us. If you must visit the city, be polite. We'll take a poor report. The Eagle's Empyrean is a bastion of light in Eleutheria's darkness. Beyond the antique facades of the Lane of Lions and Unicorns, the Empyrean rises high in steel and blue light. The constraints of its location necessitate that the Empyrean builds upwards. Careful porticos give way to expansive temples and crowded markets. People live cheek by jowl. Light is precious and easily lost. Power is conserved carefully. When times are bad, whole districts go dark. It would be easy for hopelessness to seep in. The Khan occupies his people with festivals, celebrating his people's history of the old Khanet and constant technological innovation. To be idle is to be afraid here. The Empyrean is very busy at every hour. and would we'll enjoy a respite at the Maiden and Unicorn, a tea shop on the edge of the lane, as close to home as one can be in Eleutheria. Home comfort. No matter how hard the decor tries, it can't mask the darkness visible from the window, nor soften the electric light of the Empyrean moon. Still, off-duty diplomats congregate around the triangle-cut sandwiches. <laughs> they, they drink steep tea with translators, attaches, and runners. The Maiden and Unicorn is also popular with the citizens of the Empyrean. Some come to sample the latest London cuisine. Others to do unofficial business with the London's embassy. Others, like everyone else, just come to get away from the dark. The Empyrean, the electric and neon jewel in the Con Eagle Khan's crown and the only Empyrean city in the high wilderness, a solitary bastion of brightness in the long night of Eleutheria. Eleutheria. An outrider prepares for launch. No wait, no, we'll repair. <clears throat> Beyond the city's latest ship, the eagle's latest ship prepares to head out into the heavens. Around the docks, the crowd does it, its part by releasing paper lanterns into the night air, cheering the skyfaring heroes. And we will join the ceremonies. All are welcome to celebrate and toast the eagle's power. I mean, uh, since I'm a pro Brit, I am only doing this to um, decrease my terror. An evening celebration. You you are made unusually welcome among the Empyrean citizens and encouraged to construct your own traveling lantern. For once, they use candles rather than electricity. White, pristine, waxy. You fold the bright paper as instructed and release it into the air to join the rest. Together, they rise proudly past the Xanthus moon and disappear into the darkness carrying the defiance of light against the liberation of night. The visa checkpoint. Have my visa checked? Ingress. Oh. A modest checkpoint stands at the end of the lane of lions and unicorns. Visitors to the Empyrean must have their papers checked. There's, there is a queue to get past the guards, but it moves efficiently. The Ovu, the Khan's Market, or Shang Tu. We still have some terror, so we'll go to Shang Tu, a district of recreation and amusement where music and games distract from the encroaching dark. The electric purple lights of Shang Tu.
can be seen even from the lane. The sounds of laughter carries on the wind. Laborers finishing shifts, guards just off their outriders, courtiers fresh from the palace, all form a throng streets streets away from Shangtu, headed in one direction alone. You'll have to pass through the quieter places of the city first, however. A bespectacled official? Walk away. He wishes for you to spy for him. Oh, I need to be an informant here. I'll watch the games. Let's see what it takes to get through the, um... The relay. <coughs> the Eleutherian Transit Relay to the Reach. A stone edifice scintillant with sigils is encased in a contri contrivance of steel and brass. Oh, I've already read this. Travel to the Reach with 200 sovereigns. No matter how you pay, we'll get you there safely. <laughs> ah. Okay. Yeah. Away. Look where we are. Right above Polmir's is Hybris. Let's make our way past the mold pastures and dock at Hybris. And we'll end it there. We got <laughs> we got a lot of fungus here. Scavenge. Force open the doors to the hole. What is it? Sovereigns, of course. With that, I'll see you in the next episode.